Hello friends, a big loving welcome to our very own channel, Ammu and You, where I am Ammu and I am ready with another beautiful story to narrate to you. The story that I have today for you is named The Blue Bead, written by Nora Burke. In the story, Burke paints a vivid graphic picture, rich in detail, of an exciting jungle adventure, an encounter between Sibia, a 12-year-old girl, and a crocodile as an everyday event. Burke makes skillful use of suspense and detailed visual images that make the story come alive for the reader. The story ends on a note of dramatic irony when Sibia exclaims, something did. I found a blue bead for my necklace. Look. So, the Blue Bead by Nora Burke. From deep water came the crocodile. Out of black water, curved with whirlpools and into the frill of gold shallows by the stepping stones. He was twice the length of a tall man and inside him, among the stones, which he had swallowed to aid digestion, rolled a silver bracelet. Timber was being floated down this great Indian river from forests further up, and there were sleepers lying stuck around the stones until someone came to dislodge them and send them on their way, or until floods lifted them and jostled them along. The crocodile had no need to hide himself, he came to rest in the glassy shallows among logs and balanced there on tiptoes on the rippled sand with only his raised eyes out of the water and raised nostrils breathing the clean sunny air. Around him, broad sparkling water traveled between cliffs and grass and forested hills. A jungle track came out of scrub each side and down to the sun-whitened stepping stones on which a little fly catcher, catcher was flirting and trilling along. The mugger crocodile, blackish brown above and yellowy white under, lay motionless, able to wait forever till food came. This antediluvian saurian, this prehistoric juggernaut, ferocious and formidable, a vast force in the water propelled by the unimaginable and irresistible power of the huge tail, lay lapped by ripples, a throb in his throat, his mouth running almost the whole length of his head was closed and fixed in that evil bony smile. And where the yellow underside came up to it, it was tinged with green. From the day, perhaps a hundred years ago, when the sun had hatched him in a sand, sand bank and he had broken his shell, and got his head out and looked around, ready to snap at anything before he was even fully hatched. From that day when he had at once made for the water, ready to fend for himself immediately, he had lived by his brainless craft and ferocity. Escaping the birds of prey and the great carnivorous fishes that eat baby crocodiles, he had prospered, catching all the food he needed and storing it till putrid in holes in the bank. Tepid water to live in and plenty of rotted food grew him to his great length. Now, Nothing could pierce the inch-thick armored hide. 
not even rifle bullets, which would bounce off. Only the eyes and the soft underarms offered a place. He lived well in the river, sunning himself sometimes with other crocodiles, muggers, as well as the long-snouted fish-eating ghadiyals. On warm rocks and sandbanks, where the sun dried the clay, the, which was very white, and where they could plop off into the water in a moment if allowed. The big crocodile fed mostly on fish, but also on deer and monkeys that came to drink, perhaps a duck or two. But sometimes, here at the ford, he fed on a pie dog full of parasites or a skeleton cow. And sometimes he went down to the burning hearts and found the half burned bodies of Indians cast into the stream. Besides him, in the shoals, as he lay waiting, glimmered a blue gem. It was not a gem, though. It was sand-worn glass that had been rolling about in the river for a long time. By chance, it was perforated right through the neck of a bottle, perhaps a blue head. In the shrill, noisy village above the ford, out of a mud house, the same color as the ground, came a little girl, a thin, starveling child, dressed in an earth-colored rag. She had torn the rag in two to make skirt and sari. Sibia was eating the last of her meal. Chapati wrapped around the smear of green chili and rancid butter. And she divided this also to make it seem more and bitter, showing straight white teeth. With her ebony hair and great eyes and her skin of oil brown cream, she was a happy, immature child woman, about 12 years old. Barefoot, of course, and often goosey cold on a winter morning and born to toil. In all her life, she had never owned anything but a rag. She had never owned even one Anna, not a pies, not a pie, even to buy, say, a handful of blown glass beads from that stall in the bazaar where they were piled like stars, or one of the thin glass bangles that the man kept on a stick, and you could choose which color you'd have. She knew what finery was, though. She had been with her parents and brothers all through the jungle to the little town at the railhead where there was this bazaar. And she had walked through all the milling people and the dogs and monkeys full of fleas, the idling, gossiping, bargaining, humanity spitting beetle juice, heard the bell of a sacred bull clonking as he lumped along through the dust and hubbub. She had paused, amazed, before the sweetmeat stall to gaze at the brilliant honey confections, a buzz with dust and flies. They smelled wonderful, above the smells of drains and humanity and cheap cigarettes. At home, she sometimes tasted wild honey or crunched the syrup out of a stock of sugar cane. But these sweets were green and magenta. Then there was the cloth stall, stacked with great rolls of new cotton cloth, stamped at the edge with the maker's sign of a tiger's head, and smelling so wonderful of its dressing, straight front the mills, that Sibia could have stood by it all day. But there were other wonders to see. Satin sewn with real silver thread, tin trays from Birmingham, and a sari which had got chips of looking glass embroidered into the border. She joined the crowd round a Kashmiri traveling merchant 
on his way to the bungalows. He was showing dawn colored silks that poured like cream. And he'd got a little locked chest with turquoises and opals in it. Best of all, a box which when you pressed it, a bell tinkled and a yellow woolen chicken jumped out. There was no end to the wonders of the world. But Sylvia, in all her life, from birth to death, was marked for work. Since she could toddle, she had husked corn, gathered sticks and put dung to dry and cooked and weeded and carried and fetched water and cut grass for fodder. She was going with her mother and some other women now to get paper grass from the cliffs above the river. When you had enough of it, you could take it down by bullock cart to the railhead and sell it to the agent who would arrange for its dispatch to the paper mills. The women often toiled all day at this work and the agent sat on silk cushions smoking a hookah. Such thoughts did not trouble Celia. However, as she skipped along with her sickle and homemade hayfo beside her mother. You could skip on the way out, but not on the way back when you ached with tiredness and there was a great load to carry. Some of the women were wearing necklaces made out of lal lal beaches, the shiny scarlet seeds, black one end that grew everywhere in the jungle. It was best to have new necklaces each year instead of last year's faded ones. And Sylvia was making one too. How nice it was going to be to hear that rattling swish around her neck as she crouched along with lots of necklaces. Oh, for strings and strings of glass and beads, anklets, earrings, nose rings, bangles, all the gorgeous dazzle of the bazaar, all her little golden body decorated. Chattering as they went, the women followed the dusty track towards the river. On their way, they passed a Gujar encampment of grass huts. They were not able to sell enough of their white butter or was no one to buy the young male buffaloes for tiger bait. Or Perhaps a cattle-killing tiger was making a nuisance of himself. Then they'd move on. Sibia glanced at the Gujar woman as she went past. They wore trousers, tight and wrinkled at the ankles, and in their ears, large silver rings made out of melted rupees, and one of them was clinking a stick against the big brass gharas in which they fetched water from the river for the camp to see which ones were empty. The Gujas were junglies, as Sibia was too, born and bred in the forest. They scratched their food together, stored their substance in large herds and silver jewelry. They were man in the wandering pastoral age, not stone age hunters and not yet cultivators. Ah. Now there was the river twinkling between the trees, sunlit beyond dark trunks. The women had plenty to laugh and bicker about as they approached the river in a noisy crowd. Noise frightens crocodiles. The big mugger did not move and all the women crossed in safely to the other bank. Here, they had to climb a still hillside to get at the grass, but all fell to with a will and sliced away at it wherever there was foothold to be had. Crocodiles, sometimes you could see them lying out on those slabs or clay over there, but there were none to be seen at the moment. Where Sibia was working, Wind coming across hundreds of miles of trees cooled her sweating body. She was busy in those cavelets above the high water mark of the highest flood. She had stowed some little bowls molded of clay while they hardened. Child, the sharp word, the glare of her mother's angry sweating face pulled Sibia back to work and they toiled on. 
At last, the loaded women set out to cross the river again, back home, on their way. Sibia hung back. She would just dwaddle a bit and run and see if the little clay cups were still there in the cave, waiting to be painted and used. The women were now tired and loaded, but still they talked. Slowly their voices died away, silence fell. Sibia came down alone to the stepping stones. She stepped on the first stone. She was heavily weighted. Her muscles stretched and aching. The hay fork squeaked in the packed dry grass and dug into her collarbone so close under the skin, in spite of the sari, bunched up to make a pad. At the same moment, a Gujar woman came down with two garas to the water on the other side. In order to get the good clean water, which she would quickly fill both garas to the top without sand, she walked onto the stepping stones. She was within a yard of the crocodile when he lunged at her. Up out of the darkling water, heaved the great reptile, water slushing of him, his livid jaws yawning, and all his teeth flashing as he slashed at her leg. The woman screamed, dropped both brass pots with a clatter on the boulder. Oh! The two good vessels gone. The Gujar woman recoiled from the crocodile, but his jaws closed on her leg at the same moment as she slipped and fell on the bone breaking stone and clutched one of the timber logs to save herself. The log jammed between two boulders, with the woman clinging to it and screaming while the crocodile pulled on her leg, threshing his might tail, bang, bang, to and fro in great smacking flame as he tried to drag her free. Blood spread everywhere. Sibia sprang. From boulder to boulder, she came leaping like a rock boat. Sometimes it had seemed difficult to cross these stones. In the boiling, bloody water, the face of the crocodile fastened round her leg was tugging to and fro and smiling. His eyes rolled on to Sibia. One slap of the tail could kill her. He struck, up shut the water 20 feet and fell like a silver chain. Again, she aimed at the reptile's eyes. With all the force of her little body, she drove the hay folk at the eyes and one prong went in, right in, while its pair scratched past of the horny cheek. The crocodile reared up in convulsion till half his lizard body was out of the river, the tail and nose nearly meeting over his stony back. Then he crashed back exploding the water and in an uproar of bloody foam he disappeared he would die not yet but presently though his death would not be known for days not till his stomach blown with gas floated sibia got her ram arms around the fainting woman and somehow dragged her from the water gujar and encampment where the men made a litter to carry her to someone for treatment. Then Sibia went back for her grass and sickle and fork. The fork was lying in the river. She saw the blue head, not blue now, with the sun nearly gone, but a no color white blue and its shape wobbling in the movement of the stream. She reached her arm down, missing it at first, because of refraction. Then lay in her wet palm, perfect, even pierced, ready for use, with the sunset shuffled about inside it like gold dust. Her heart went up in flames of joy. Then she picked up her fork and sickle and the heavy grass, set off home. I, I, what a day. Her bare feet smudged out the riddle mark of snakes in the dust. 
there was the thin singing of malaria mosquitoes among the trees now. The stars came out, she noticed. On the way back, she met her mother out of breath, come to look for her and scolding. I did not see till I was home. And Celia, bursting with a story, cried, something did. I found a blue bead for my necklace. Look, a life, thousands of people live, which we, the privileged ones, fortunate ones, are absolutely oblivious to. You may please like, share, subscribe to it if you've liked the story and press the bell icon too. Thank you so much for all your comments that you keep sending me. Thank you for all your love and support. Thank you for listening to the story. And please wait for me again when I come back with another story to narrate to you. Thank you and bye-bye.